If you've ever wanted to become an environment artist, well, now's your chance. Introducing the brand new Environment Artist Survival Kit, a brand new course designed to take you from a complete beginner to an absolute master in Unreal Engine. You're gonna be creating everything you see on the screen here. Pretty amazing, isn't it? Now, early bird pricing is just starting. The course has just dropped. So if you wanna get the course at a reduced price, hop on right now and grab it before it's too late. Let's get into the video. Hi everyone, I'm Maria. I'm an environment artist and recently focusing on vegetation. A few months ago, I worked on this project called Water Will House, and I was invited by Stylay Station to present the creative process, hoping I will inspire other artists. I wanted to take on a challenging project that would be a new milestone in my portfolio. My goal was to learn Unreal Engine 5 and create a much bigger and more open environment than anything I've done before. The main goal was to create a fantasy environment with modular architecture and lots of vegetation. I wanted to blend nature and architecture to create a relaxing and cozy space. The design combines whimsical PBR textures with vibrant colors to create a charming and visual appealing setting. As the base concept art for this project, I used this artwork called Waterville Farm. I love the color scheme and lighting in this piece, as well as the shapes. It looks very well suited for the kind of modular workflow that I plan on using. Vegetation was one of my main focus points, so I expanded the scope of the scene to include more greenery surrounding the house. I added a forest in the background, ferns near the stream, and lots of flowers. I used Blender for the blackout process. I started by placing a Human for Scale reference. At first, I used rough shapes, placing some cubes as placeholders to determine the rough measurements and proportions. This was a good moment to check the silhouette from the main camera view. So I imported this blackout to Unreal Engine 5 to set up the scene with the camera. Setting up the block out the camera for the main shot right from the beginning helped me understand the composition better. After taking some screenshots of this block out, I used Krita to sketch some options for the composition that I was considering. This helped in making the iteration process easier. After some tweaking here and there, I started to detail the block out by splitting the big shapes in 4x4 and 2x4 meter pieces, so they'll have a nice and uniform appearance. Here I had a few challenges, especially when deciding the places that require unique pieces and which would be the best approach to split the modules. I tried finding as many repeating patterns as possible to reduce the number of modules that I needed. As an example, I split the part of the roof over the wheel in three sections, two of which are the same with the unique piece in the middle. In the end, I re-imported everything into Unreal Engine, this time replacing the old rough blockout with the more detailed one. I started the modeling part by handling the most reused pieces first, like plaster walls, wooden beams, windows, and also trees, ferns, and flowers. I tackled this generally in the order of bigger to smaller elements to quickly create a visual context for the scene that can serve as a guideline. Starting with the plaster wall modules, most of them were 4x4 meters to be easier to work with. Where needed, I made extra modules of different sizes, mainly by cutting up the square ones. For example, I used this method to make the 2x4 module for some edges, and the 4x4 module with holes for windows. I also made sure that these modules have enough vertices for vertex painting, which we'll be using later in the texturing process. I tried to keep the number of modules low to maintain an efficient workflow. Making the plaster and wood material triplanar helped a lot with this, as it allows me to scale existing modules without needing to retexture them, but I ended up making some unique shapes for the curved ones. As there was no way I could have scaled them on only one axis without it being obvious. For the cobblestone module, I started by making the low poly in Blender, creating the general shape and then using the self-fracture add-on to split the mesh into medium and big individual stones, which worked pretty fast. Next, I moved to ZBrush and added more details to the model. As an example, let's take this chimney piece. I started by shaping it in Blender. Once I finished the base, I imported a mesh in ZBrush where I used Dynamesh to subdivide it. I continued by smoothing the edges and making some bevels, then I polished everything with the clay polish function for a more finished look. All the modules of the plants have been sculpted in ZBrush, focusing on studying the diversity of the plant's life present in the scene. After looking up some references, I started making some blockouts, to have an idea of what should be unique and what will be reused. I ended up sculpting only one or two petals and leaves per plant, but this was still pretty flexible. Using these parts, I made a few variations per plant, Keeping in mind a few stages from the plant's life cycle, from driving a healthy to more sad and close to wilting ones, I started the sculpting process with a sphere, shaping it until I was happy with the result. I used Dynamesh to move faster, because at this step the topology was not that important. Using the same method, I shaped the leaves and stem, 
For the finer details, I used your brushes and applied the clay polish function again at the end. Finally, I arranged the plant parts to bake them on a flat plane. I used Petri to put together trees and ferns. It is a really nice tool and it was easy to work with. I started by creating a trunk and adjusting the scale and thickness to match my vision. I also increased the thickness of the tip from the skin menu to make it look more uniform and natural. I've added the first branch layer and increased their number. This layer is responsible for the overall tree structure. I wanted the tree to have a more cone-like silhouette, so I oriented the start angle upwards and decreased the gravity. The extent parent type was set to any, to have a continuous shape of the trunk. At this point, I copy-pasted the branch layer to create smaller branches. I adjusted the scale and thickness, and I also changed the start angle, so the branches can look more grouped together and with their orientation following their parent. In the boundary settings, I decreased the first value, so the small branches can start from near the trunk. For the third layer of branches, I duplicated the second one. This time, I increased the start angle, so the leaves look spread out all over the place, making the tree seem puffier and more even. But I will hide this layer and never see it again, only using it as support for the leaves. At this point, I imported the textures for the trunk and leaves. Once everything was ready, I created the leaf cutout and made the material to side it. I tweaked the scale orientation, curling, twisting and folding settings until I liked the results. To make the canopy look less noisy, I kept the leaves in clumps and oriented their normals to point away from the tree. This way, the shading looks uniform and kills some of the details in the shadows. I also adjusted the puffiness and unify sliders. I always like to add some rules from the details tab. I think that increases the immersiveness by a lot and also helps with guiding the eye from the grass layer. After finishing the first one, I made four other trees. The randomize button helped me a lot with the tree's shape variation. Starting from fully developed trees, I duplicated and randomized the settings, scaled them down and made some saplings. This way, I could have a sort of gradient in scale, without having abrupt changes in the visuals. This kind of gradient in scale is present for all the other kinds of vegetation in the scene. Jumping from short grass to tall trees might be cool in some environments, but I wanted to make it look a bit more messy and untouched by humans. The plant modules were mainly assembled in Blender. I started by cutting the plane with the texture on, separating the modules, cleaning the topology, and then I continue with the actual assembling process. I like to begin with the flower heads, make them separate objects from the rest of the plant, and move them on the stem until I'm happy with the general aspect. After the models were ready and before importing them into Unreal, I vertex painted with red a gradient of what I wanted to be affected by the wind. The baking process was done in Marmoset's tool bag. For the vegetation, the big maps I needed were mainly the ambient occlusion, opacity and normals. I also manually created a mask map for the petals and parts I intended to change color. I made this by duplicating the opacity mask and covering with black what I didn't want to be affected. For the sculpted architectural pieces, the process was mostly the same, except that I added a height map so I could use it as a mask to blend the mink texture with some dirt and moss. An exception to this process is a 3D grass plant. I ended up creating just the opacity map and placing a solid blue normal map, so the normals are always oriented upwards. This required less effort because the color was generated by the runtime virtual texture. The texturing was one of the most interesting parts so far. I had lots of fun with both Substance Painter and Substance Designer. In Substance Painter, I imported the masks I baked in Marmoset's tool bag and used them as a base. Then I created a fill layer with the base color for each object. I placed a warm hue layer with the top to bottom gradient mask to give off the feel of the warm color of the sun. For a more interesting color variation, I overlaid a cold hue color layer, this time with the bottom to top gradient to fake a bit of shadow. Where needed, I created a dirt layer using the ambient occlusion as a mask, and I blended it with some slope blur to give a more painterly look. In Substance Designer, I created the majority of the tileable textures, like grass, dirt, plaster and wood. The most fun one to make was the terrain grass. The main focus for the texture was trying to make it look natural and not unidirectional. The grass should look good from any angle. I started with the brush stroke created in Krita and used it as a stylized interpretation of a grass strand. I added some noise to make it look more natural and then I used a splatter circular node to make the grass clumps. Using the tile sampler, I placed the grass clumps all over the place. I used the cloud noise node for a more organized scale and look. Before going to the coloring part, I added a slow blur node to enhance the brush stroke like texture. For the coloring part, I used the same pattern from Substance Painter. For the grass tips, I added a warm color to fix some sunlight. 
and for the bottom I added a cold hue to add some shadows. I adjusted the colors with an AGSL node to create a more consistent look unifying the colors. Using the same method I added some tiny flowers and clovers, which I masked with a noise texture so the tiny plants are grouped in clumps, just like you would see in nature. In the end I exported the ambient occlusion, normals, height and roughness to get everything ready for importing into Unreal. The materials were such a fun thing to make. Some of them were a real challenge, like the water material from the mill area, but others were just cute and pleasing to work on. I wanted to make it look like the mill is interacting with the stream and the water is being lifted up by the pedals, then falls off of them. I did this by attaching water planes to each individual paddle, and the main challenge was making them look shorter as they move higher. I handled this shortening effect by changing the opacity mask in the water material. First, I take the absolute world position on the z-axis and I remap it to convert the ranges of heights reached by the object into a range of UV offsets. This offset gets added to the texture coordinate and the result is used as the UV input for a linear gradient. In the end, the V gradient is used as the opacity mask. This technique works with any water material with minimal adjustments to round the corners on the bottom. I find the flower material being really useful. To have more color variation on the flowers, I made a shader that takes three colors as parameters and picks randomly from their interpolation, then overlays the result onto the base color of the plant. For this method to work on objects placed in foliage mode, I get their position using the mesh particle pivot location. I use the position of each flower to generate a different number every time, in the range of 0 to 1. This number is then used as the alpha of the LERP node. Then, the LERP result is overlaid on the base color texture. I use the mask map I created earlier, multiplied by a parameter value to control the overlay intensity. Finally, the wind movement uses the simple grass wind node, and the red channel of the vertex paint acts as a mask. This way, the base of the plant is moving less or not at all. Playing with the lights was a fun challenge in this project. It was the first time I was in charge of lighting such a large scene, so I had a lot to learn. I tried to keep it simple, I mainly followed the complementary contrast of warm light and cold shadows. I placed two directional lights pointed downwards with an orangey hue as the main light, to give a warm and cozy feel to the scene. I then used two additional directional lights with bluish colors that are pointed to the side of the building, to get the shadows to look colder. These cold lights don't get shadows of their own, they are only affecting the shadows already present in the scene. In order to bring more attention to the focal points, I use some point lights. I place these lights on the open window, the mill and the balcony. These are pretty subtle, but they are enough to catch the eye. I added some height variety on the terrain using the landscape mode. I sculpted some terrain noise, increasing the height of the background to make the grass more visible. The grass, flowers and trees have been placed using the foliage mode. Once I set up the brush, I started painting the plant in clumps. The blueprint for the mill was interesting to make. I placed the mill as the parent and the dripping water planes as the children. I set the rotation speed of the mill to 30 degrees per second, and in order to keep the water planes perpendicular to the terrain, I made the planes rotate by 30 degrees per second in the opposite direction. Well, I'm sure this can be done in a more technical manner, but sometimes simple solutions are good enough. The iteration process might be a bit uninteresting if it's too repetitive, but I found this cool feature in Unreal Engine 5 where I can use my VR headset to navigate through the scene and see how it feels like for the little grey human I place as the scale reference. It really helps seeing it from an NPC perspective, seeing how the proportions are and how the assets are working together overall. Well, jokes aside, it was a nice experience and I will do it again. And I recommend you all to check this feature out if you have the possibility or opportunity to do it. For the final touches, I added some small VFXs for falling leaves, fireflies and butterflies. Adding VFXs and animations in the environment can really bring it to life and enhance the immersiveness. For example, the water mill I described earlier with its motion helped guide the eye towards that area. The wind effect from the plant material and the falling leaves VFX makes the environment look less stiff. The warm color fireflies and butterflies VFXs help with the friendliness and coziness of the environment. 
and the decals placed on the plaster help break the pattern of the triplanar texture, making it look less repetitive. Looking back on the project, it was the most rewarding piece of work I've done so far. Initially, the project seemed overwhelming and I wasn't sure how to approach it, but taking it step by step kept me moving forward. Well, this project really was a fantastic experience, mainly because it helped me polish my skills in natural environment creation and architectural modularity. Looking ahead, I'm thrilled to keep exploring the creation of outdoor and open environments, experimenting with environmental storytelling and having a strong focus on interesting vegetation. It was a really fun adventure. I have learned a lot in the process and I hope this breakdown has been helpful and inspiring. If you like this project, you can also check out my Artstation page, where I will post more projects soon. Thank you so much for your time and thank you Stella Station for this opportunity.